Following on from the last day's video lecture, we spoke just at the very end about the usual practice of relying on samples rather than relying on a full population. As I said, there's only one time every four years when the entire population is engaged in some type of statistical exercise, and that is the census. Okay? Outside of that, businesses, schools, government, they all depend on samples, okay? Groups of people. Usually probably one of the five types we looked at already, whether it be cluster sampling or stratification or whatever it's going to be, in order to try and see and test how is the population at large feeling about a certain proposed um, amendment or how is somebody feeling about a particular product or is a product selling well, whatever it's going to be, okay? But samples are the way that we go and these are the reality. So we're moving away from the population into samples. Now, the heading, I suppose, is self-explanatory. As you take, say, four samples of 10 people, there is variation between those samples. So the 10 people over here and the 10 people there and the 10 people here and the 10 people there, they are four groups, okay? As you move from sample to sample, things vary. So whether it be a normally distributed thing like height or IQ or whether it be opinion or whether it be favorite color, they change from one sample to the other, all right? So what st statisticians have discovered is that the more samples they have, then when you gather the statistics from those samples, the actual mean of the sample and the standard deviation of the sample seem to fall in line with the population, all right? So there's evidence out there su to suggest that if we take a decent number of samples. Okay, so if we're dealing with the population of Ireland, your number of samples would have to be, first of all, maybe over 100, more, okay? But you're dealing with a number of samples. The more sample groups you have, then the closer you will get to the reality of the population. And that's key behind what we're about to do in this particular section, all right? Now, if that's the case we said here, the values of the mean, the mode and the median of random samples depends on the particular value in the sample. So again, go back to your four groups of 10. The mean, the mode and the median of each group could be slightly different. So what we do is we work with each of the samples individually, then we pool their results into one statistical exercise. And that statistical exercise has revealed to us that the more samples we have, then the greater the chance that we will model truly what the population feels or what the population is saying about a particular question or a particular car or a particular color or a particular um, trend, okay? So these values will differ obviously from sample to sample and this variation is called sampling variability. That just basically means the differences between each sample. So we're gonna take a look at exercise 5.1. It's the worked example in your book. It's on page 143, but I think it's a very good example to point out to you how samples actually reveal something about the population, okay? It's a nice guided exercise. I'm gonna do it here with you. It is done in your book, but I'm gonna do it with you from the point of view of being able to just guide you through the critical parts of why samples are important. So a census was carried out and the measurements were recorded for the population. 112233. They want you to show the distribution in a frequency table. Now it's a very, very small set of uh, data, but anyway, we'll do what it tells us to do. So number one, show the distribution in a frequency table. Well, first of all, the numbers that you have are one, two, and three, and the frequency of each number. How many times does one appear? Twice. How many times does two appear? three times. How many times does three appear? Twice. So that is your frequency table. Now again, if you want to just make it all nice and boxed off, that's fine. You can do that like so. And there's your frequency table. Okay. Is the mean of the data a parameter or a statistic? Now, I think I went through these words with you before very early on when we were doing statistics and I'm going to do them again. It's very simple to remember. If you take the first letter of each, a parameter and a statistic, okay parameters always refer back to the population whereas statistics always refer back to the sample so the easiest way to remember that just put the p's together parameters are for populations and statistics are for samples so in this case here what are we dealing with we're dealing with the population so because we're dealing with the population this data and its mean will be a parameter and they ask you to explain why, because the data refers to the entire population. That's why, okay. What is the mean of this data? Now, it's very simple to get the mean of a frequency table because all you've got to do is multiply the data, the values in each column, and then add the answers together, and then divide by the amount of numbers in your frequency. So I'll just do it here at the side of this. Two ones are two, 
plus three twos are six, plus three twos are six, and that's to be divided by two, plus three is five, seven and eight. Okay, six and six is 12. We're in that two, three is two, and three is five, six, seven, sorry, seven, my mistake. Two and six is 12, two and six is 12. Six and six is 12, and two is 14. So that gives me 14 over seven, which is two. All right, so there's your mean. Okay, part four. How many different possible sample size six can be taken from the population? So again, that brings us back to the previous chapter. First of all, how big is the population? Seven. What's the sample I want to take from the population? Six. How many times out of seven can I choose six? Do you remember that? Okay, that's the answer. It's seven C six. Now, let's simplify things first before we go mad on multiplication. Because the number on the bottom is greater than half the top, we can subtract the bottom number from the top one to get 7C1, which is very easy. 7C1 is just 7. If you don't believe me, check your calculators. Okay, then it says, list all the possible samples of size 6. Now, there's a bit of a difficulty here because, first of all, the two ones are different from one another, the three twos are different from one another, and the two threes are different from one another. Why? Because they're coming from different people. Okay, we're dealing with a population. The first one comes from person A, the second one comes from person B, the third, uh, the sec, the first two comes from person C, and so on. So, what I'm just going to do, just to clarify this, what you're going to do, I'm going to write it down here one, one, two, 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 three, and three. But I'm going to call them 1A, person B, C, D, E, F, and G. And now it's very easy to see what the sample sizes of 6 actually are. Let's take the first one. 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. How many is that? That's 6. And uh, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's the first one. Okay. Now, in this case, what have I done? I've taken person A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's change that a little bit. Instead of going for person F, let's take the 3 from person G this time. So I get another one, one, two, 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 three, because that's person F and that's person G. Okay, so there's two possibilities. Now let's take two ones, two twos, and three threes. Okay, however, the two twos might be two C and two D, but then you could also have one, one, two C, two C, and two E with the two threes. Or you might have one one with two D and two E and then the three threes. Now I'm just trying to clarify where I'm getting these different sets of six from, okay? Because obviously the three twos are coming from different sources. So therefore they are different twos, if you want to put it that way, because they're coming from different sources. So we've got to look at them in that way. That's why if you just label them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it'll help you to remember that these pieces of data here are taken from seven people. All right, just call the people A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five. There's two more. So what have we got to do? Let's take one with the two twos and the two threes. Will that give me? Yeah. Okay. Now, because again, there are two ones, that's one A. Let's take one B with two, 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 three, and three. I mean, have we got now? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And that's it done. There's your seven. Because we did say there was seven ways to choose six. The hard part is to see where the group of sixes are because repetition of the data is allowed because the sources of the data is different. So if I label them all A, B, one, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I take one, one, two, two, two with three F. Then I can take one, one, two, two, two with three G, see? Then I can take one, one, two, two, three, three, or I could take one, one, two, two, three, three, or one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on and so forth. So they are the six different, or sorry, seven different groups of six that I have selected from the original uh, data. Okay, part six. List, uh, find the mean of each sample listed in part five. Well, they're not letting us off here easy, are they? So now we've got to use those six groups and get their means. Well, that's quite okay from the point of view of having a calculator beside you. So let's do the first one. One and one is two, four, six, eight, nine, ten. That's 11 over six. Okay. Next one will be 11 over six as well. Next one, two, four, six, and six is 12. That there will be 12 over six, and that one will be 12 over six. Then the last one, three, five, seven, ten, thirteen 13 over six. 
and 13 over 6. Okay, so let's work out 11 divided by 6, first of all, which is 1.83. Okay, so that's going to be 1.83 as well. And then we have 12 over 6, which is 2, 2, 2. Then we've got 13 over 6, which is 2.17. 2.17, 2.17. Okay, so they are all the means. So there's the mean there. Equals, 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 equals. Okay, so they are your means. Okay, part seven. Is the mean of each sample an example of a parameter or a statistic? Is the mean of what? Each sample. Sample S. So therefore it is a statistic. And explain why. Because the mean is being taken from a sample. And therefore because we're dealing with samples we are dealing with a statistic. That's the explanation. Part 8. Show, using, show the sampling distribution of the sample mean in a frequency table and display the distribution using a histogram. Okay, so again, we want to build a frequency table, but this time for the sample mean. Okay, now let's do the same thing as we did before. So you've got your number and you've got your frequency. So you have your number and then you have your frequency below. Now this time the numbers are 1.83, 2 and 2.17. Okay. 1.83 occurs twice, 2 occurs three times, and 2.17 occurs twice. And it says, display the distribution, the distribution using a histogram. Okay, let's do a quick histogram here. Now, remember what we do in terms of the frequency table on a histogram. The numbers here, they go on the bottom. Okay, so you have 1.83, then you have 2. And then you have 2.17. And all we want to do now is to give each one its own height. So 3, 2, and 1. So the first one is going to have a height of 2. The next one is going to have a height of 3. And the last one is going to have a height of 2. And it says display the distribution using a histogram. Fine. Then find the mean of the sampling distribution. Now, find the mean of the sampling distribution. So, let's go back to this table here and work out the mean. So, the same thing as before. We multiply the columns. 1.83 multiplied by 2 becomes 3.66. 2 times 3 is 6. And 2.17 multiplied by 2 is 4.34. If I add those together, 3.66, I end up with 14. And if I add up the bottom line, 2 and 3 is 5 and 2 is 7, look what happens. I get a mean of 2, which is extremely interesting. And I guarantee at the last part will ask it, yeah, what do you notice? The mean of the sampling distribution, okay, that's the mean of the samples, ends up being exactly the same as the mean of the population, which verifies for me mathematically that it is perfectly fine to work with samples that represent the population as long as all the criteria are followed random selection uh, a proper representation in the sample of the population and so on as long as all those things we talked about in the previous uh, classes are held when you're making your samples <coughs> then you'll notice that the mean of the sample is the same as the mean of the population that's a lovely question because it brings us kind of down a long road to demonstrate the fact that the samples that are being used here do reflect the mean of the population. Okay, so the mean of the sample is the same as the mean of the population. What I also notice is this. Look, what type of a graph do I get? Well, I get a normal distribution. And that normal distribution, again, is evidence of the fact that the data you're collecting is something that is normally distributed throughout not only the samples, but therefore also the population. OK, so it's a lovely exercise, lovely question, which I would ask you, clear the screen like so. And go and do it again yourselves. OK, go and do that again yourselves to make sure you get a feeling for why samples are OK to use. OK, now let's move on. So the sampling distribution of the mean, that basically means, say do the way, it's the mean of all the samples. OK, and it's how those means are distributed. In the previous question, we discovered that the means were distributed normally. And once it's a normal distribution, which, by the way, we're only going to deal with in this particular case, we're only going to be dealing with normal distributions. But once they're normally distributed, well, then we've got a whole heap of things that are open to us, like z-scores, uh, probabilities um, and percentages in terms of the number of people above or below a certain 
uh, statistic, okay, because we're dealing with samples. All right, so if we are interested in the heights of all 16-year-old boys in Ireland, the information we will need to gather will be a measure of centre and a measure of spread. Now, that's the same with any data. So if you're interested in gathering any data, okay, so if you're interested in gathering information, then there's two things you've got to be very careful that you do measure, and that's the measure of centre. There's three of them, the mean, the mode, and the median, and also a measure of spread, whether it be the range or whether it be the inter quartile range okay again from a previous class that we had but they are the two things we're going to look for in this particular section it is impossible to obtain everybody's height so we need to rely on samples if we take lots of random samples if we find the mean of such samples and plot their distribution we discover that the distribution is symmetric about the mean in other words it's a normal distribution that's what we would expect because we're collecting heights, we're collecting something that is dictated by nature. And if it's dictated by nature, then obviously it's going to fall within the normal curve. Okay, because that's what nature does. It distributes uh, um, parameters or distributes uh, data according to the normal curve. Okay, so the distribution for any sample mean becomes normal as the sample sizes grow, regardless of the size of the population and the distribution. Now, what about the number of people in my sample? That's important, okay? And they do say that there is a kind of a cutoff of roughly 30. If you're trying to model your population, something that's quite big, then your samples should be quite big. So they do use 30 in your book as a kind of a, a reference value, all right? Now, the lovely thing about this is that there are two possibilities. What happens if my sample size is below 30? And what happens if my sample size is above 30? And you'll be delighted to know that for the purposes of leaving cert honours maths, the answer is nothing, providing, and we'll say it here, providing that we're dealing with something that is normally distributed. OK, so in this case, just take a look at this diagram here. Even if the population itself has no apparent curve, if it's totally randomly distributed and if the population parameters don't seem to make any sense, once we start to go to samples, the statistics begin to show normal normal distribution or normality. OK, a normal distribution. And notice, look at the size of the people in my sample. OK. There are five people in my sample. I'm beginning to see a quite a distinctive normal curve. By the time I've put 25 people in, there's no arguing. This is most definitely a normal curve. But what I want you to notice is that you'll notice 16, 16, that it falls along the same mean. OK, so if your numbers in your sample are less than 30 or if they are greater than 30, then we have a little bit of mathematics to do. However, we're going to try and keep it down to the bare minimum because what I'll say to you is this. If the sample size is less than 30, providing that the data we're using is normally distributed, then the mathematics is exactly the same as if you were using a sample that is greater than 30, irrespective of the underlying population trend. Okay, now listen to that again. If in the population, the data doesn't seem to be gathered in any particular way. When you start to take samples from the population and put them together and combine the mean and look at how the mean is um, varied or distributed, then you'll notice a normal curve begins to appear. The more people you have in your sample, the more normal the curve will be. OK, so that's important. So therefore, we have to distinguish and we've got to make sure that when we're taking samples, we take samples of a decent size. OK, so we've got what we call the central limit theorem, which is exactly what I've just been talking about in English. When selecting a simple random sample of size n from a population with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of, the, of sigma, then, first of all, if the sample size is greater than 30, then it doesn't matter about your population. OK, because the one thing that will happen is you'll have a standard deviation that will be adjusted slightly. It will be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the number of people in your sample. OK, now for the purposes of mathematics at this level, where that is the formula we're going to use for any particular sample size, because in the course, the sample sizes, if they're less than 30, will be normally distributed. OK, and this is the second thing. If the sample size is less than 30 and the underlying population is normal, then notice what? 
the standard deviation of the sample is exactly the same. So now we've got four things to worry about, okay? And I want to just wrap this up here now. We've got the population and we have a sample. Now let's go through the four things I need you to know before we move on. In a population, there is a mean and there is a standard deviation, okay? Okay, in the population, the population of the mean is mu. That's the symbol we use, okay? And the standard deviation for a population is sigma. However, for a sample, the sample mean is x bar. Now, that's what we were calculating in the worked example a few moments ago. We worked out what the mean of the sample was. That's called x bar. And the standard deviation of the sample is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the number of people in your sample. So you have to be extremely careful and very, very sensitive when you're reading these questions to the words population and sample. You gotta listen very, very carefully and in your head, realize what you are dealing with. Am I dealing with the full population? If so, then I'm dealing with parameters. Okay, the mean will be mu and it'll be a parameter. The standard deviation will be sigma, it'll be a parameter. Am I dealing with a sample of the population? And if I am, then we hope, and notice what we said there, we hope that if the sample is greater than 30, irrespective of the population, X bar, the sample of the, or sorry, the, the mean of the sample will be exactly the same as the mean of the population, okay? And sigma over root N will be the new standard deviation for your sample. Got that? So that's extremely important. So for population, mu is the mean and sigma is the standard deviation. For the sample, x bar is the mean, but it's also going to have the same value as the population mean. And lastly, sigma over root n will be the new adjusted standard deviation to reflect the deviation in the sample rather than in the population. OK, so I want you to try and remember that table because that's extremely important. Now, the corresponding Z score for the sample mean is as follows. X bar, that's the mean of the sample minus mu, which is the mean of the population, over the adjusted standard deviation for the sample. Now, if you go back and remember what Z scores were when we were dealing with just ordinary statistics of the population, it was X minus mu over sigma, okay? And what did I tell you at the time? It was the statistic under test minus the average of the population divided by sigma, or I suppose you could call this the parameter under test, yeah? So it was the parameter that was under test minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Now, how does that change when we're working with samples? Well, when we're working with samples, we've got to remember that what we're going to be looking at is the mean of the sample. So it's the mean of the sample minus the mean of the population over the standard deviation of the, whoops, apologies, over the standard deviation for the sample, which is sigma over root n. So that's the only change we have to make in Z scores, okay? So if we deal with the population, X minus mu over sigma. If we're dealing with a sample, X bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. And that brings into consideration the fact that you're dealing with a sample size of n people or n objects. So that is the new formula that we're going to use as we move along into the next section. So it's important to remember that sigma is the standard deviation of the population and sigma over root n is the standard deviation of the sample. Okay, so keep that in mind and listen very carefully to what we're dealing with. So let's take an example here. Page 148, question six. Now I didn't put the question into the book because it's quite long. So I have it, or into the slides I should say. So I'll call it out here as we move along. Page 148, question six. Okay, the manager of a hotel finds that guests spend a mean of 12.5 minutes each day in the shower. Assume the shower times are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 2.8 minutes. Find the percentage of guests who shower for more than 13 minutes. Okay, so listen to that again. The manager of hotel finds that the guests, now that means all the guests, so therefore we're dealing with a population. And if we're dealing with a population, here's what I want you to write down. The mean is going to be mu and the standard deviation is going to be sigma. And for a population, the Z score is nothing more than X minus mu over sigma. 
okay now because of the fact that we're being asked for a percentage of guests in part one the percentage of guests that's going to be taken from your z scores so the first thing i've got to remember is that the data being given to me is being given to me in terms of minutes in the shower now minutes in the shower has to be turned into a z score so the first thing i'm going to do here is work out what's the mean let's read it again the manager of hotel finds a guest spent a mean of 12.5 minutes so that's mu is 12.5 Assume the shower times are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 2.8 minutes. Okay, so 12.5 minutes and 2.8 minutes. Let's turn that into a z-score. What does it say? Find the percentage of guests who shower for more than 13 minutes. So we want the percentage of guests who shower for more than 13 minutes. Now that has to be turned into a Z score. So what do we do? The probability that Z is greater than 13 is equal to. So we take the formula that's up here and we turn it into a Z score first of all. So X is 13 minus the average, which is 12.5. Now X is the 13 because that's what we're being asked, but that's the, the um, parameter under test. So it's asking us, find a percentage of guests who shower for more than 13 minutes, okay? Minus mu, which is 12.5 over sigma which is 2.8 so the z score here is 13 minus 12.5 divided by 2.8 and that gives me an answer of 0 0.178 0 0.1786 okay so therefore what i'm going to try and do here is i'm going to change that 13 because it's a z score now into 0.1786 so it's going to be z greater than 0.1786 so what do we do we go to the normal curve remember all this normal curve like that where is 0.1786 well keep in mind that that is zero okay that's always going to be zero so 0.1786 is going to be here somewhere all right 0.1786 now what do they want? They want the probability or the percentage of people that spend longer than 13 minutes. Now, because I've turned the 13 minutes into a Z score, I have to make sure that it's this area I'm going to get. But I've got a problem. If you remember, your tables don't give you the area to the right hand side. Tables only give the area to the left hand side. So instead, what I could say is that it's one minus the probability of being less than 1.1786 okay so instead of getting that result which your tables won't give me what i'm going to do is i'm going to take one minus everything that is to the left of that line that's what the tables give me so that shaded area there is one that's the whole thing minus the area to the left of 0.1786 so i go to the z score tables which are on page 36 of your book yep and point one seven eight six point one seven eight six let me see if we can find that point one seven eight six so we can go to one seven eight or one eight actually if you want to point one eight okay so point one seven eight six the closest i can get to that is point one eight so 57 this is one minus point five seven one four that's it because that's the answer to the z score being less than 0.1786 one minus 0.5714 is equal to four two eight six now what does that mean question says find a percentage the answer is 42.86 percent what guests shower for more than 13 minutes so that's it so less than half shower for more than 13 minutes but again you're bringing in your z scores for that one okay next part part two the hotel has installed a hot water system that can provide enough hot water providing that the mean shower time for 100 guests is less than 13 minutes find the probability that there will not be enough hot water on the morning that the hotel has 100 guests now listen to that again the hotel has installed a hot water system that can provide enough hot water provided that the mean shower time for a hundred guests 
the previous part was all the people in the hotel this is only a hundred so part two is a sample question so now we're dealing with statistics and not parameters okay so we do the same thing again let's go back what are we told well first of all for the sample this time we're told that n is equal to 100 all right because that's what we're told it's 100 guests we're also told the same as before that mu is equal to that's the average 12.5 we're told that sigma is equal to 2.8 so these are all the data that's given to us at the start of the question so there's the three things i need which means now that i can turn all of this into a z score as well so z score for this one will be x bar which is what go down to 13 minutes so it's going to be 13 yeah i've got to put in x bar equals 13 that's the in the second part as well so it says the hotel has installed hot water system to provide enough hot water providing it the mean shower time for the hundred guests for the sample so that's the mean of the sample so it's these four pieces of data that i require so it's going to be x bar minus mu over sigma divided by root n see because we're dealing with a sample so you're now dealing with the kind of the variated formula so fill all that in x bar is 13 minus mu 12.5 over sigma 2.8 divided by the square root of 100 and your calculator will do that very quickly for you because square root of 100 is a 10 so that becomes 0.28 so it becomes 13 minus 12.5 divided by 0.28 and the answer there comes out as 1.786 okay so that now is the z score for my sample okay so we're dealing with statistics now not parameters so what do i want to do question says find the probability that there will not be enough hot water in the morning that the hotel has 100 guests now you've got to go back to the first paragraph there provided that the mean shower time for the 100 guests is less than 13 minutes so what's the probability that z is less than 13 that's what we're looking for okay now we've turned this into a z score of 1.786 so i want the probability of z that should be x by the way x there um x bar because it's a sample less than 1.786 so we go again to your tables look up 1.786 and 1.786 so that's 1.79 i suppose you want to kind of get as close as you can to it 1.79 is point nine six three three now again let's just go to the normal curve that's what i should have done first of all where is 1.786 1.786 well there's zero so 1.786 be about here okay now what do we want less than that so that's okay that's fine so that's all that area there so that's 96.33 percent but the question says that there will not be enough hot water so that's over here so we take one minus 9633 and 1 minus 0 0.9633 comes out as 0 0.0367 which in percentage terms is 3.67 so there is just a little over three percent chance that there won't be enough hot water if the guests what does it say there if the mean shower time is goes over the 30 minutes all right so if we went over the 30 minutes then there's a three percent chance there won't be enough hot water there's a 96.33 percent chance you put it that way 96.33 percent chance that there will be enough hot water if everybody stays with shower times of less than 13 minutes okay so again i have this printed out for you so we can go through it there there's your mu and there's your standard deviation there's your sample of 100 and there's your x bar of 13 okay so z greater than 13 for the population we've done that already that means it's one minus z being less than 0.1786 which we've done which is 42.86 and then when we go to the z score for the sample we adjust the formula slightly just to bring in the square root of n underneath the standard deviation so this is the only change the only change is down here and that's 1.7857 which means again that we're looking for the the percentage above the 1.7857 z score which i told you already is the same as 1 minus 96.33 which comes out as 3.67 so there's a 3.67 percent chance that there won't be enough hot water if they stay under the 30 minutes or put it another way 
there's a 96.33% chance that there will be enough off water if they stay under the 13 minutes. So both of those ways of stating the question or stating the answer are perfectly fine. Okay, look, I'm going to leave you with these. So I want you just to work with that formula. It's a small deviation. And again, remember, I'm going to go through it again for the population and for the sample. Yeah, for the population, you have a mean and you have a standard deviation. The mean for the population is mu. The standard deviation for the population is sigma. Okay. The sample mean is x bar and the standard deviation of the sample is sigma over root n, where n is the number of people in any particular sample. So they are the four things that you will have to collect in these questions. So when you're reading the questions and the question specifically mentions samples, you need those four bits of data because then we know that x bar for the sample will be uh, the mean and sigma over root n will be the standard deviation for that particular sample. So listen carefully in each of the questions for the terms population or sample. Have a look at those questions there. And if you need any help with any of them, don't hesitate to call.